security and insecurity of home and enterprise network routers, but we seldom talk about their industrial brothers. So the question is, what's with security of industrial routers? I'm here today to talk a bit about this question and present my research of one particular industrial router model. But first, I would like to introduce myself in brief. I'm an application security specialist at Kaspersky Lab Security Services. Um, in my work, I focus mostly on embedded systems. Um, uh, study the security of embedded systems, which turns uh, to reverse engineering custom protocols and file formats and uh, conducting vulnerability research. Here are some examples of industrial uh, routers. You can see on the slide. Uh, they usually have metal bodies, can be installed on rails or inside racks, and uh, almost all modern models support cellular networking. Uh, and some models support uh, also industrial protocols like Modbus or Profinet, for example. Um, here, uh, my tar target of my research was Digi WR21 industrial router um, from Digi Transport uh, family. Um, Digi is an international vendor specializing on uh, um, embedded systems and equipment for communication networks, including wireless ones. And according to the official DIG response to our report concerning vulnerability issues found in WR21 during the study, the same vulnerabilities and weaknesses existed on uh, other transport family routers. So here on the slide you can see three models from DIG WR11, DIG WR, uh, WR21 and WR44 from top to bottom. And Digi WR44 is top of the line uh, in this family. Um, so industrial routers are widely used in factories, power stations, manufacturing automation, ATMs, and other industries to provide connectivity between different parts of informational infrastructures. Uh, in such crucial areas of use, uh, security is very important because uh, the cost of experiencing a security flow can be usually high. And industrial routers, like just like any other routers, support a lot of uh, network connection protocols like HTTP, SNMP, FTP, SSH, Telnet, and so on. Um, of course, as I said, mo many modern models feature cellular su uh, support because their location could be on a remote site or inside of a moving vehicle, for example, a train or a car. Um, Additionally, many industrial routers support different uh, vendor-specific proprietary network protocols for solving special tasks. Um, and I'm sure you all know that vulnerabilities in such services can um, allow potential mail factors to gain uh, access to critical um, industrial um, networks. So uh, that's why the decision was made to take a look at uh, industrial routers from the security perspective. And eventually, we shall now have a look at the map of usage of Digi transport routers. Uh, using Shodan, we found 578 devices around the world. Uh, it was in uh, May 2017. Uh, and also, I would like to mention some previous uh, research currently available. Uh, the first one is uh, the research by quality specialists about the thermal routers. It raises the problem of hard-coded cryptographic keys and uh, credentials uh, right in routers uh, firmware. And uh, another great uh, material is a blog post uh, from Cisco Talos Group about uh, Moha industrial routers. Um, and it shows how quickly vulnerabilities can be found uh, even using only uh, black box uh, techniques for analyzing. So let's start the research. And uh, we thought that a good place to start was uh, looking inside of the router and see hardware uh, equipment and uh, hardware uh, parts it consists of. So here's how the router looks like without its body. Um, the CPU is IMX28, uh, which is based on ARM9 core. Um, also, for official installer support, there is a separate uh, Huawei uh, LTE model, uh, which is connects to the main board through the PCI Express, Mini PCI Express uh, uh, bus. Um, what is uh, also interesting here is that the router has um, an RS232 port. And uh, it, has, it also has four contact holes uh, marked as USB download and JTAG debugs. So we investigated that holes and find out that one of these holes is connected directly to the ground of uh, the, root, uh, the main board of the router. So this means that it's not enough for JTAG 
So we uh, thought it's uh, some kind of a USB download interface and we checked the doc documentation to uh, the CPU and found out that uh, a recovery, emergency recovery USB interface is a well-known capability of IMX28 CPUs. Um, it can be used even to download firmware to the external flash memory. Um, but uh, in our research, we were lucky enough not to break the device, so we didn't use this interface, actually. Uh, now we know that we are dealing with ARM, uh, and we are ready to look at the firmware of the router. But first, as we have a neurosurgery here, uh, we thought that it would be great to have uh, some kind of X-ray photo of our patient. Here it is. Uh, at the left, there is a main board, and on the right, there is a, a Huawei uh, model. Uh, so... Uh, how to get the firmware? Uh, we thought that the easiest way would be if a vendor provides some kind of updates on their support website. So we checked this website and found out that there are updates available. Um, we just downloaded it from there um, and didn't want to deal with hardware um, stuff like dumping non flash memory or something like that. Um, so... Uh, cur current firmware version, but at, at the time we were making the research, it was May 2017, uh, it was 5.2.17.12, uh, and <coughs> the firmware ships as an ordinary archive containing several files. Um, files uh, file image looks like it's either encrypted or compressed in some way because it has high entropy, and file boot.rom looks like saying ARM code, so we thought that's a good place to start, reverse engineering. Um, the structure of the file is extremely easy. First goes boot code size. Um, the first word, double, double word is a boot code size, then goes CRC16 padded with two zero bytes of the code itself, and then goes the code. Uh, it's ARM little Indian code. Um, the code loading address was easily guessed by hand. It's, mm, it wasn't a problem. Um, so we started analysis, um, t took a closer look at the code and uh, found some interesting strings. For example, um, this string arm sarian bios means that this code is uh, some kind of a bios. Um, it's a multitasking system and uh, also it definitely supports some kind of a, a console, but we don't know how to access it yet. Uh, so we did further analysis in order to understand how the mm, code uh, itself, how the image uh, file uh, is loaded and how the operating system is loaded. So uh, it turned out that image file has a header displayed at the slide. Its length is 0x80 bytes. Um, by studying boot.rom boot code, we figured out uh, uh, the meaning of some of its fields. Uh, the first two byte field at offset zero is CRC16 checksum of the image in compressed and encrypted form. Next goes uh, CRC16 checksum of the image in plain text format. Then goes uh, boot code loading address, uh, image code loading address. Then goes its size uh, in a compressed form. Then goes the same value as uh, code uh, loading address, but it's now code entry point. Uh, and uh, one byte value at offset 0x1a is a bit field indicating whether uh, encryption or compression is active. Um, all, mo all modern uh, uh, firmware versions uh, support both encryption and compression. And um, this, our case, in our case, it was so too. Uh, and starting at offset 0x80 goes the image code itself, compressed and encrypted. So we continued uh, analyzing the boot.rom code in, in order to understand uh, what uh, encryption and compression algorithms are used there. Uh, and it turned out that uh, there's no actual encryption, it's just XOR with a uh, generated key stream, and the key stream is generated uh, based, on, based only on a hard-coded uh, value, initial value, which is 0xAF4. So we were uh, enable, uh, we were able to easily uh, reproduce the um, key stream, XOR the firmware, and get the compressed version of the firmware. Next, we uh, dealt with the decompression routine. We easily found it on BIOS, but uh, the point here was we didn't want to know what's going on inside of this uh, procedure. 
uh, though it's not so complicated, but uh, still we use Python to rewrite it as close to assembly as possible and uh, decompress all images. It's rather um, universal and reusable approach. But uh, of course, Unicorn can be used to emulate uh, this procedure. Uh, it's another approach to this task. Uh, so after decompression and decryption, we found out that we are dealing with a Siren operating system. Um, no documents available in the internet. We searched a lot, uh, and the only thing that we found is the fact that in 2008, Digi acquired Siren uh, company, which also developed uh, industrial routers. So we think that uh, Siren operating system was developed originally by Siren engineers and can be found inside Siren industrial routers if they are still in use. Um, so after um, after that, we wanted to know what is Siren X exactly, how it works, and uh, we wanted to get familiar with, with this system. And uh, we started from connecting to RS-232 port of the router to find out wha what it is for, and it turned out that it's just an operating system console available there. Um, but later, when we looked through user manual to the router, we found out that uh, this the same um, command interface is available not only through RS-232, but also through the network using SSH, telnet, even web interface, and even sending by sending SMS commands to the router, SMS messages. Uh, that's great. Um, so the router that ships from uh, vendor has uh, predefined uh, default username password account, uh, but it can be easily changed, it's not hard-coded. Um, and the command line itself is not what we used to observe in Linux-like system. It has uh, a bunch of uh, custom commands. Some of them are documented in uh, devices user manual, some are not. Um, so internally, each command has a procedure that handles this command. Uh, and at that slide, you can see um, the table of these uh, handlers, uh, part of the table in, with these handles right inside of the device's firmware. Uh, and uh, at the right of each procedure, there is an access level. Uh, the point is that users in system have access levels from zero to eight. Zero means full control, super user, or um, root, as you like. And... Um, uh, <coughs> In order to ex execute every command, user must have at least that privilege level that is uh, supplied in this table. So, for example, to execute mem command, uh, we need to get to have a user uh, access level at le at least three, or maybe one, two, or zero. Um, some uh, commands uh, are protected by additional uh, challenge response scheme. There are actually five commands protected by this scheme. Um, and it's very useful in order to get uh, access to one of these commands, a uh, user must have a, a zero access level and also it uh, must know a secret password hard-coded inside of the device's firmware. Um, we think that these commands are for maintenance purposes and they were protected by this additional authentication scheme just in order to uh, protect users from executing these commands and uh, dealing damage to their routers. Um, but we didn't uh, uh, figure out how to use these commands. They are not; they were not uh, useful for us in the, during the research. Uh, next goes the tasking subsystem. Uh, the operating system is multitasking. It supports cooperative multitasking. It means that every task uh, uh, is executed until it uh, decides uh, to pass control to next task. Um, each task in the system has a name, an identifier, which is a value from zero to zero XFF, and a priority. Priority is used by a scheduler to decide who who's going to execute to be executed next. Um, a task can have a task routine, which is an endless loop that does all ta actions of the task. And if a task doesn't have a task routine, it doesn't consume processor time and uh, it doesn't actually execute it. Um, but all, all tasks have signal handler routines. Signals are some way of inter-process communication. Um, and when a task uh, sends a signal to another task, a uh, signal is a subsystem of the operating system, takes this task and passes it to the signal handler of the uh, receiver task. So it calls this signal handler. Um, 
So the other option for interprocess communication is messages. Messages are asynchronous. This means that if a task sends a message to another task, it's continue its execution immediately uh, and doesn't wait until this message will be uh, received and properly handled. But uh, signals are uh, synchronous. Um, also, tasks can have separate threads uh, that uh, execute in pseudo parallel to and uh, allows to uh, to make several actions at a time. Um, so now goes file system of the device. Uh, it's a custom uh, file system. It's very trivial. It it has a static directory tree. So there's no API in the system for uh, adding. Uh, new directories or deleting directories. There's also a mounting point for external USB devices. If you remember from the slide with uh, devices hardware, there was a USB port uh, on the device. It's used for connecting external memory drives for uh, easily uh, uh, transferring files between devices or for storing logs in, uh, on remote, uh, removable uh, external drive. Uh, uh, logs of the device, I mean. So this uh, USB sticks uh, must be formatted as FAT16 or FAT32 uh, volumes, and uh, so um, this means that the file system has, uh, th the operating system has some driver support for FAT file systems. Um, also, it has some funny feature. Um, all files uh, which whose names begin with uh, prev uh, prefix are considered protected from reading or writing, so these files are, uh, read write protected and even super users cannot read these files. For example, uh, this mechanism is used to store private SSH keys on the router's uh, file system. Um, so when you rename a file, add prev prefix to it, so it uh, becomes no longer available for reading or writing. Um, okay, networking. Uh, networking is a rather difficult subsystem. It has uh, it uh, is implemented by several tasks. Uh, the most low level is th uh, the Ethernet task, which implements Ethernet hub driver functionality, then goes TCP task that provides uh, a socket obstruction layer, and then goes TCP utils task and uh, other applications that uh, use network. Uh, TCP utils implement uh, basic uh, network protocols like SNMP, SNTP, DNS, and some others. Uh, so we already told about uh, users in the system. We know that they have access levels. Uh, so now let's check what's with usernames and passwords, how they are stored. Uh, usernames in the system are case insensitive and they are stored in the device configuration file in plain text format. But passwords are stored in a separate file um, and they are protected, uh, so they are encrypted. Uh, there are two mechanisms for encrypting. First one is uh, that XOR again with hard-coded key. And the, uh, the second option is more secure. It relies on real crypto. Um, and by default, XOR is enabled, but uh, user can easily change that on device's uh, preferences. But uh, no matter what encryption scheme is used for permanent password storage inside of the flash file system, uh, uh, Passwords, usernames, and access levels always present in plain text in RAM of the device. Um, and we will use that later for adding our own users in a demo. Um, and there are no security policies for user passwords at all in the system. So we decided to take a look at how the uh, secure password storage method is implemented. Uh, it uses AES 192 uh, in CPC mode and um, um, in order to use this cipher, we need initial vector and the key. Initial vector is generated as a random 16 bytes uh, sequence, and a secret key is once generated and then stored inside of uh, device's uh, external flash memory uh, in raw form. And by raw form, I mean outside of the file system. And uh, it is generated based on 16 bytes random value, uh, MAC address of the device, serial number of device, and hardware revision of the device. Uh, plus sign here, the scheme means uh, concatenation. So initial vector after encryption is concatenated with the ciphertext, base 46 encoded, and stored inside of the uh, separate uh, file for storing passwords. Um, 
So here's how the table with usernames, passwords, and access levels look like right side of device's uh, memory. I'll uh, tell you how we uh, managed to read this uh, memory later. Um, thanks to keeping passwords in RAM, checking user's passwords reduces to a simple comparison of strings. Uh, and uh, encryption and decryption of passwords are used only when saving passwords into file in the file system or loading them in, into RAM. Okay, we are done with usernames and passwords, and let's now switch to memory management in Siren operating systems. Um, okay, the, uh, here is uh, the slide you can see the memory map of IMX28 CPU uh, and how it's used by Siren OS. There is a Siren OS um, chunk of memory used for storing operating system code, uh, stack, uh, stacks of all tasks, and uh, static data like strings for uh, operating system code. Um, <coughs> uh, so there's no any virtual space for each task. Uh, all memory is flat, uh, everything's simple. Um, and the system uses two global memory pools. It's RAM global pool and non-volatile RAM global pool. Uh, it allocates memory from it uh, for different purposes permanently. So there's no free procedure here. And uh, one huge, uh, one, one large uh, uh, global pool uh, allocated from RAM global pool used for heap uh, for tasks. Um, so there's a memory manager uh, which uh, is used of, uh, so this uh, pool can be used to allocate uh, memory pools and free memory pools by each task. Uh, okay, uh, next uh, topic I would like to mention is uh, system logging. Uh, all system logs are uh, saved into eventlog.txt file. And additionally, there is a debug log that can be enabled uh, using uh, uh, serial port or uh, telnet. But some services uh, start generating debug uh, messages only after turning on specific debug parameters in preference. So we can uh, separate services we want to debug and services we, we don't want to see debug output. Um, also, Siren operating system has a Python support. Um, DG developers uh, implemented uh, a separate task in the system uh, responsible for uh, handling Python code. Uh, it's an interpreter. Uh, it uh, supports lots of different models and uh, uh, it's well documented by vendor at their website. It's used for extending web, uh, router's functionality by users, can be, can be used. Um, so I already mentioned that the system uh, uh, can generate uh, random pseudo random values how it's done it's done using the strong crypto algorithm fortuna um, and we decided to test its implementation on the device on in siren operating system so for, in order to do that we used python simple python script uh, that ran right in the uh, in the system in the device um, Thanks uh, for getting this Python interpreter right inside of the device. And we uh, generated eight megabytes pseudo-random value, uh, pseudo-random sequence, downloaded the file, and just Googled for a tool to analyze, uh, that analyzes uh, pseudo-random uh, sequences, and it uh, showed us uh, rather good results, uh, very close to true random stream, so uh, the pseudo-random number generator is Good. Um, so that's all for uh, system subsystems. Uh, now it's time to start enumerating network interfaces and understand how we can influence the system. Uh, the router has a lot of different network interfaces. In this talk, I would like to stop on services that where something interesting was found, and with the complete list of services and their analysis, you can uh, you can refer to our white paper that will be available on GitHub. Uh, I'll provide you with the link at the end of the talk. Um, so the first interesting thing to mention is this uh, Insana console command. As uh, as you remember, con uh, system console can be um, accessed using network, not only by R RS-232. Um, here is the typical buffer overflow, stack buffer overflow. Um, 
uh, with arbitrary code execution. But uh, in order to exploit that, uh, a potential malfactor must have at least high privileges user account in the system um, because this command is executed only by high or super user uh, privileges. Um, next goes FTP service. We we know that there is a lot of uh, uh, good uh, fuzzers for FTP service available on the internet, so we used fuzzing for uh, starting this service. And one thing to mention is that anonymous user is de deactivated by default. Um, so in order to get access to FTP, you, uh, we need to authorize using system uh, user accounts. Um, so what we found user using fuzzing is that uh, simple year error in FTP type command handler, uh, which has uh, which works with format strings, but it doesn't uh, support it with uh, parameter here, and that's why uh, when FTP send function is called, it uh, uh, takes arbitrary four byte value from the stack, uh, which is some garbage and. Uh, tries to treat it as a, a pointer to somewhere, so that in most cases uh, causes uh, the CPU exception and uh, a reboot of the device. Uh, as I said, uh, all, uh, anonymous user is uh, disabled by default, so uh, in order to uh, we can uh, access this, uh, a potential malfactor can access this vulnerability only if uh, he, uh, if, if uh, anonymous user is enabled by user uh, or if uh, he has credentials, which is a problem by itself. Uh, next goes a web server, it's based on an old go-ahead version. We uh, really wanted to know which exact version was used, but we didn't succeed with that. Uh, the only thing we know for sure is that it's vulnerable to old CV back from 2002, which allows reading ASP files in non parse forms via specially crafted URLs. Um, in our case, it was available only after user authentication because web service is protected by authentication too. Uh, it uses system accounts for authentication. Um, <coughs> and we also tested uh, modern CV. Um, s uh, remote code execution CV from uh, uh, CGI subsystem, but uh, it turned out that uh, this custom web server uh, port uh, doesn't have CGI subsystem and is not vulnerable to that. But uh, this, is, uh, this web service has an interesting feature called remote command interface, um, which sounds great. Uh, what it can do, it can uh, allow users to execute command commands, thus uh, providing full control over the system uh, using uh, HTTP POST request for that. This feature is well documented by vendor, it's not something uh, hi hidden. Um, and uh, RCI, actual RCI commands are sent as, XM, uh, as XML scripts uh, in writing POST requests as a payload. And the authorization of user is uh, HTTP basic only. Uh, no digest authentication is supported. This means that uh, user must provide a base64 encoded username and password in each uh, post uh, request header. Mm. So here is the example of the packet. Uh, suppose we have a user with the username user3. Um, and access level low in the system. Here is how the uh, RCI request user three uh, question mark looks like. This means that we want to know who we are in the system, what access level we have. It's like uh, something like who am I command maybe in Linux. Uh, and here is uh, the answer of the server. We are user three, uh, we have access level three, which means low access level and uh, one thing to mention here is that we are executing on behalf of some strange user called Cloud Connector 18. So this sounds very uh, suspicious and we wanted to know which privileges th the, this user has in the system. Because there are no uh, credentials for this user available on RAM table of users and we cannot uh, 
just input uh, Cloud Connector 18 and some password and access the system, for example, from uh, the system console. So this user is something embedded into system without any credentials. Um, and what rights? Uh, what what ri rights does it have? Um, it uh, so uh, then we decided to uh, make an experiment and uh, send uh, a command to uh, escalate our privileges to zero, which is zero user three access zero command. Here is the response of the server. It, it tells us, okay, everything is done. And we, to ensure that, we can send who am I command once again and see the result. We are user three with access zero now, and uh, we are still cloud connector uh, executing as cloud connector 18. So our user now have su uh, super user access to the system. So it's local privilege escalation vulnerability, and uh, in order to execute it, a potential malfactor should have some credentials to the system with at least high privilege, uh, with at least low privileges. Some privileges suit here. Uh, so next goes the SNMP service. Uh, the device SNMP service uh, supports all uh, three protocol versions. Um, SMP version one, two, and three, and they are all enabled by default. This means by router replies to any uh, to SNMP command of any version, um, and uh, usernames and passwords for SNMP version three are not the same as system ones. It uses separate credentials, and uh, these credentials can be uh, uh, enter uh, can be registered uh, through devices setup. Um, for example, through console or web service, web interface. And um, during this uh, study, we found two vulnerabilities in SNP uh, service I would like to talk about. Um, uh, there, uh, the, the one is in parsing octet strings, and the second one is a parsing variable bindings. Uh, parsing octet string is something uh, general for SNP version one, two, and three, because all of these versions use deal with uh, octet strings. Uh, SNMP version 1 and version 2, and for example, uh, parse octet strings when they um, check community strings, and SNMP version 3 parses uh, octet string when it checks username. Um, so here is the code that parses uh, an octet string. Uh, it's provided by maximum, maximum length and a buffer where it copies the result uh, of parsing an octet string. Um, so if we have a constructed octet string, um, we skip an important uh, check of the length uh, highlighted by green, um, but uh, we either don't copy the, our initial uh, octet string into output string, so output buffer. So this seems uh, correct and logical, but uh, it still returns length. So uh, <coughs> Regardless of maximum length specified to this function, it returns length in case uh, arbitrary length in a case of con constructed octet string. So here is how this function is called. For example, um, it's provided with uh, buffer and. Uh, um, buffer length, which is uh, 255 in our case, and then um, the code closes the string with zero. But if we provide uh, arbitrary uh, length of a uh, constructed octet string, we can write this null outside of the buffer. Um, so uh, we started to investigate where is this community string buffer, and it turns out that it's a static, bu static bu buffer uh, that lies uh, on memory statically. It all, always has the same address, and uh, it's somewhere near the end of the operating system image. We didn't find anything useful we could override because we can move only to the right of this uh, address. Uh, and uh, still we have denial of service, denial of service because we can write to unmapped memory, uh, uh, which causes um, CPU exceptions and uh, device reboot. 
So uh, as I said, all SNMP versions parse octet strings uh, before authentication of users. So uh, all these versions are affected by this bug. Uh, and in order to exploit it, uh, potential malfactor doesn't want to uh, have credentials uh, for user or for router. Then uh, the next vulnerability is something more, far more interesting and far more complicated. Um, uh, let's suppose, consider an, uh, an ordinary SNMP message uh, which contains a variable binding. A variable binding is a pair of object identifier and object value. Object identifier is a bunch of numbers separated by dots. You can see at the slide uh, example. And uh, consider that uh, the SNMP parse variable bindings function is responsible for parsing the variable binding and writing object identifier and object value to its stack frame. First goes uh, object value identifier, which is 0x100 bytes, and then lies the object identifier buffer, which is twice longer than that buffer. And um, what could go wrong here? Uh, revise that SNMP protocol allows object value to be the identifier of other object. In that case, it's logical to assume that uh, object value buffer must be at least uh, uh, that large as, as object identifier buffer, but it's twice smaller. So uh, in practice, it turned out that uh, uh, overflow can happen here, but uh, we can only run over the object value buffer and can reach the end of the stack frame uh, to change saved link register value on the stack. Because if we want arbitrary code execution, we need to get, uh, the simplest way is to get to the link register value saved on the stack and change it to our arbitrary value to get uh, the arbitrary code execution. And uh, we took a closer look at the object identifier structure and revealed that first four bytes of this structure are used for identif uh, for uh, store to store actual length of the data stored in the buffer. So we can overwrite uh, the length of this object identifier uh, with our fake length and, uh, and then we started figuring out how, how this uh, object identifier will be used um, next. Uh, next, this object identifier is copied into large buffer in heap, which is 0x uh, 420 bytes long. Um, and first, the object identifier is copied, which is important, and other data goes after that. So no problem if object identifier length exceeds 0x 200 bytes. Because uh, in this case, only just some ram random garbage from the stack will be copied to heap and then overwritten with the object value and other da data. But if we run out of the whole buffer, we corrupt the next buffer header uh, as it all happens in heap. Every buffer has uh, a service header uh, in front of it. So in th that case, we can uh, cause unknown behavior of the system, for example, sudden crash. So everything, uh, so we, we don't want that. We want to stay inside of this buffer in heap. Uh, so everything would go fine in this case. Um, so what happens next? Let's assume we want to read uh, some system parameter by using SNMP. In order to provide us with its value, as the system walks through the SNMP object tree according to our object identifier until it reaches a leaf in this tree. This leaf stores information about access permissions for the corresponding ab object and its value. Um, in the perfect world, our object identifier must exactly apply to one particular leaf in this tree. But in real world, object identifier can be too long so that when the system reaches a leaf in this tree, uh, some part of it, we, which we call the object identifier tail, would be still unparsed. Um, in that case, the object identifier tail is copied to the stack frame of other function, which we call SNMP get request, and uh, it has a buffer uh, with a length 0x204 for this purpose, which would be enough for storing even the largest object identifier, which is 0x200 bytes. Uh, but not in the situation where we override the object identifier length. In that case, uh, 
by adjusting the object identifier length and the length that will be parsed uh, during walking the object tree, um, we can uh, fill all the stack frame of SNMP GET request function and easily get to the saved link register, change it to our arbitrary value, and get code execution. Um, and uh, the question is where to place um, exploit code in, in that case. Uh, and we can r remind that uh, in the first uh, SNMP bug, we had a SNMP community string with static address, uh, yeah, which is, is uh, 256 uh, bytes long, this buffer. So uh, more than enough to store the exploit. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we know the address, so we can easily change link reg register to that value and uh, get our code executed. Um, this vulnerability exists because a variable binding list is parsed before checking whether the specified community string is correct for SNP version 1 and 2. And when the system um, finds the requested object uh, and reveals its access rights in the tree, only then it checks the community string. Of course, this trick won't work for SNP version 3 because in that case all packet gets encrypted and uh, the object uh, Identify, uh, object variable binding will be parsed only after decrypting with the corrected, correct key, which we don't know. Uh, so as you can see, this bug uh, a little bit uh, tricky. So we decided to search for some debugging mechanisms in the operating system in order to uh, provide a proof of concept for that exploit. Um, and uh, that's where we uh, remembered about uh, strange console writing BIOS of the device. Uh, we didn't know how to access that time, but uh, we, we decided to return to that and investigate how to get access. Um, and uh, after a while, we succeeded with that. It turned out that all we need to do is reset the device, and during the reset, it expects a backtick symbol through RS-232. And if it sees that symbol coming from RS-232, it goes to uh, the console mode, uh, BIOS. Uh, before loading the operating system image, it goes to console mode. And uh, this console mode is additionally protected with hard-coded uh, very secure password. Um, and uh, here on the slide, you can see how it's stored right inside of the firmware. Um, after getting access to this uh, uh, command line interface, uh, we had a lot of interesting commands. For example, the dump register command, which dumps registers from last illegal exception, so that seems to be suitable to debug. And also we had uh, primitives for memory read and write, and we can also write uh, data to write to RAM of the device, read RAM of the device, and go to arbitrary address. Uh, this means executing from arbitrary address. Go command does execution from arbitrary address in RAM. Uh, so first, uh, we tried to use dump register command for uh, debugging our exploit. Um, we took... Uh, the value 0x d e a d b e e 0 and uh, tried to, to adjust object identifier length and uh, object identifier par parsed uh, part uh, in order to that value to be right on the saved uh, link register value in stack of this NMP get request function and uh, in order to, for us to see the crash uh, uh, when the system tries to fetch instruction from that address. So we used, uh, so we sent our SNMP packet, uh, rebooted the device, get into the um, BIOS uh, console and execute uh, uh, dump register command. So it uh, starts printing our exception, uh, a register state, and then the, go, uh, the code executes that tries uh, to read value from PC and uh, print instruction that caused the uh, crash. 
no matter that uh, we have a prefetch uh, exception. So it means that we don't want to read this again because this will cause exception again. So this exception uh, overrides all data from our previous exception and uh, this is, I guess, exception inside of an exception, something like that. So dump register worked very fine for us. We decided not to use it and uh, switched to memory read write, write primitives found in the um, BIOS console. So the idea was to change uh, some uh, pointers to ha uh, handlers uh, of console commands in the operating system to pointers that point to memory read and write procedures because uh, they are uh, prototypes of these functions uh, were uh, the same. So that uh, allowed us to uh, boot from uh, the modified op operating system image, which included uh, memory read and write primitives. But uh, to build uh, the debugger on top of that primitives, uh, we needed to do hard work, so we decided to, to search for JTAG before that um, in the device, maybe it's available. And, uh, mm, but, but using this interface, we were able to dump all uh, RAM of the device and find, uh, for example, that funny feature with that usernames and passwords are in plain text in RAM, all this, while power applied to the device. So what's with JTAG debugging? We checked the user manual, uh, the manual for the um, CPU and found out that it has JTAG pins, but it's a BJ chip and uh, we did not manage to find it can uh, this JTAG chip, uh, uh, JTAG pins to be connected to some obvious contacts on the circuit board. So, in spite of that, we didn't give up and soldered the CPU uh, to find uh, contact holes on other side of the board that correspond to JTAG pins of that CPU and uh, used uh, thin copper wires, isolated copper wires, to connect to these uh, contact holes uh, and uh, get JTAG. And it turned out that it uh, really worked. Uh, we, we, we used uh, Bus Blaster by Dangerous Prototypes for as a JTAG adapter and uh, OpenOCD as a software. And um, after using, uh, after configuring everything out and uh, starting, uh, JT, uh, starting the device and halting it, we got two news. The first one was good and the second one was uh, sad because the first, uh, the first news that uh, JTAC is active, we saw the uh, open CD for works fine, it prints the ID of the target and everything went fine. But uh, during approx uh, but since uh, approximately two seconds after halting, the device rebooted. So probably the watchdog is hiding somewhere and spoils our happy lives. So we thought that and uh, went to BIOS code uh, and saw that uh, interesting string that really watchdog is enabled, no options for that. We cannot, um, we cannot, we can't turn it off using some standard sy system uh, primitives. So we, again looked at the uh, processor manual and found uh, the ha exact hardware register responsible for enabling or disabling watchdog timer. And we just rebooted the router again, um, entered BIOS, um, and using memory read write console commands, we uh, write uh, uh, zero to register, which disables the watchdog, and uh, after that we exited this uh, console uh, rebooted uh, as normal and uh, uh, halted the device using JTAC and everything worked. So finally we were able to uh, debug uh, the SNMP service and uh, develop uh, proof of concept easily. Uh, now here's the video I would like to show you as a demo of how this exploit worked. Um, so 
when we developed uh, this exploit for custom operating system, we thought, what, what could we do to get, uh, no, what, what can we do with this exploit? So we thought it would be great to add our own user uh, right inside of the table in RAM memory. As you remember, there are access levels, usernames, and user passwords in plain text in RAM at a static address, no address randomization or something like that. Everything, memory, everything is clear, and we can just uh, add our own user. Um, also, we thought it would be great to disable that uh, funny um, in, um, protection mechanism uh, preventing reading private files. So we can, could, for example, read private SSH keys for the router. Um, so that's what we used. Uh, we only needed uh, several memory writes uh, for achieving all that. Uh, we added user with username one and password one, just for simplicity, with super user access, and nopped uh, the check for uh, if a file starts from a prev uh, prefix. That was very easy. Um, so let's watch the video, how it worked. So first we are connecting to the web service of the router just to know we are dealing with DQWR21. Uh, we try our username and password 11, but it doesn't work because we don't have such user in the system. So we use uh, standard credentials in order to um, access a web service of the router. Uh, here's how the web service look like. We have nothing to do here now, so log out. And uh, let's move on to the console and try to log into the system using SSH. First, let's try username one and password one um, as with web service. So it doesn't work. Then we should use uh, standard credentials, username, password. So here, is, here it is, we are super user, uptime is two minutes, two seconds. Um, then we try to type, uh, print our private SSH keys stored in the device. Cannot open file, even if we are super user, because it's private. Uh, so now, uh, let's start our proof of concept. It sends a SNMP packet with uh, proof of concept exploit for that, uh, which uh, adds user with username 11, uh, disables private file protection, and uh, changes web server a little bit. So now we can access our router using SSH with username 1 and password 1, and we are super user. The uptime is 2 minutes 55 seconds, no reboots. That's great. Um, now we type private SSH file. Here is the private SSH key. Um, everything works. And uh, now let's access the router again using web servers. Credentials, username one, password one. Login, successfully. Uh, router was hacked, then we just changed the static string in the web page. And um, then we go to the event log. Here is how event log.txt look like. It can be printed uh, right uh, from the web service. Here are our login uh, entries. We can clear the log easily. And that's all, log out. So here's how it worked. Um, and we are now close to the finish line, but one more thing uh, I don't want to omit is solar networking support. Uh, in this research, we decided to use our custom base station to talk to the router, the router using SMS messages. We scanned the device from cellular network to find out what services are available. Uh, it turned out that uh, services were still the same as for Ethernet scan, no differences in that. Uh, 
the other reason we absorbed cellular networking capabilities of the router is was the ability to accept console commands as SMS messages. First of all, we checked who could send these SMS messages to the router. The thing is that the router has a white list of uh, telephone numbers inside, and it accepts comments only from uh, telephone numbers that appear in this white list. By default, uh, the white list is empty, and careful filling of this white list allows flex flexibly restrict access to the command console. And of course, we checked routines that parse SMS messages, but didn't manage to find any bugs in that. Uh, and what's interesting also that is that uh, Huawei modem used in the routers is managed by an Android operating system. We found firmware for it in the internet and studied its format. Um, Besides Android kernel and file system, it includes three ELF files for Qualcomm Hexagon CPUs. We didn't go further in this direction, but cellular networking is still a very interesting research vector. Um, also, we managed to find that strange uh, connection available at TCP port uh, 4005 um, of the router. Um, it's AT command interface for the modem without any authentications. We, we still don't know whether it's some kind of misconfiguration in our special case or all routers have this feature. And uh, here's the timeline of the, res of the research. Uh, so in, Ju in May 2017 we started, in July we submitted Ad, uh, advisories to the vendor with FTP uh, denial of services and MP denial of service and remote code execution, uh, command line local code ex execution, and uh, they were patched uh, in August. And uh, in September, we, septem uh, we submitted some weaknesses and hard coded credentials keys. Uh, and also RCI local privilege escalation, but uh, they were not fixed, and because vendor considered as this as no, non not vulnerabilities, and also in uh, vendor published the official response. Um, so here's the finish line of the talk. Um, almost all vulnerabilities were fixed, except of the local privilege escalation by RCI, uh, but still nothing, uh, and. Um, uh, the official vendor response is available through this link. Uh, research materials uh, will be soon available on GitHub. This will include a white paper, some scripts for unpacking uh, firmware and analyzing it, and uh, also this uh, GitHub uh, page contains some, all, all, all already contains some pen testing tools. Uh, you can check it out and see. Um, so that's, Using the moment, I would like to help my uh, to thank my colleagues for help with the research and, of course, the security team for prompt response. That's all I would like to tell you today. Thanks for your attention. Please, if you have questions, ask. Uh, any questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, so you, you said uh, for the SNMP bug, but I th if I understood correctly, you didn't uh, exploit it on SNMP v3, but on SNMP v1 or 2. Do you actually require the community st string as well? or Are you talking of about the first bug or the second? The last one, the, the last Stack one. Overflow, SNMP one. Stack Overflow. Um, and uh, so, so do you need the community string in the SNMP? Uh, no, we use community string buffer to uh, store our exploit, so we don't need a community string because uh, the community string gets checked after uh, okay. the SNMP object identifier tree is accessed and the right object with uh, which contains access levels for this object and some other uh, information will be found in the okay. tree. Okay, makes sense. So Thank you. So thanks for the great talk.
Um, you mentioned Sarian used Yarrow as the PRNG. Did you reverse engineer the int internals of that to see what it uses as entropy sources? Because that can often be an issue uh, in embedded systems. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I did a quick look, uh, and I think it uh, uses some kind of uh, data revealed from sending messages between tasks as an entropy source. I think that is, but I'm not quite sure because I didn't uh, reverse engineer the whole uh, PRNG. Um, so, so that's, mm, I think uh, messages are used as an entropy source between tasks. All right. Uh, any more questions? I think that's everybody. Thank you.